Welcome to The Real News Network. I'm Lynn Fries in Geneva. This is part four of a series with Peter Drahos, who's explaining the story of intellectual property linked to trade. Joining us from Australia, Peter Drahos is a professor at the Australian National University at the School of Regulation and Global Governance. He holds a chair in intellectual property at Queen Mary at the University of London. Peter Drahos is co-author of Information Feudalism, Who Owns the Knowledge Economy? Welcome, Peter. Thank you, Lynn. I'm very glad to be here. In part three, you talked about how when proposals came out of the United States and Europe to strengthen intellectual property rights, key developing countries resisted. You explained they weren't against intellectual property, but they were against excessive monopoly privileges. Talk more about how that developing country resistance was broken at the Uruguay round of negotiations that created the TRIPS agreement under the administration of the World Trade Organization. Yes, I think TRIPS is an interesting case study in uh, how to change rules for the world or how to make rules for the world. And the moral of the story is that you have to establish rings of consensus so the first ring of consensus was amongst uh, key US industry players. And then they reached out to the United States trade representative and convinced the trade representative that the intellectual property agenda was a good agenda for the United States. And then from there, uh, the CEOs of companies uh, reached out to their counterparts in Europe, in Japan, and brought them in. And then uh, from there, uh, with the assistance of the United States trade representatives, a Friends of Intellectual Property Group was formed. So these were countries that were traditionally allied with the United States, countries like Australia, for example, and Canada. And so the idea was to continue building these bigger and bigger rings of consensus until you isolated the resistors. That's the key point here, that you needed these big rings of consensus so that you could isolate the resistors. And who were the resistors? Well, India and uh, Brazil. Of course, China was not part of the negotiations at this time because it was seeking membership, and so it was right on the outer. And so what happened is that the circles of consensus were expanded and then Key developing countries were threatened with trade sanctions. Uh, both the European Union and the United States were involved with this until at the end, all resistance was crushed. That was the key point. And so that by the time you got to the, to the signing ceremony in Marrakesh um, in uh, 1994, there was no resistance. Everybody dutifully trotted up and signed the agreement, and it was all over, really, without any citizen input at all. Um, and everybody who was uh, part of the process um, acknowledged that it was a done deal. You said that the architects of TRIPS took great care to define TRIPS as a simple justice because it was such a complex injustice. Take us through one example of uh, the kind of injustice you're talking about. Once African countries understood the significance of intellectual property rights, they immediately began to take steps to try and do something about it. South Africa is a good example. They introduced uh, provisions in their uh, Medicines Act that would make it easier to get access to cheap, antiretroviral virals. Their reward uh, for doing this, for serving their citizens, was litigation by pharmaceutical companies who claimed that they were breaching TRIPS. So we, had, we have here a, an example of the cost to public welfare of signing on to agreements that contain monopoly privileges uh, that affect access to medicines. Um, and the history of this is well known. I mean, the pharmaceutical companies named Nelson Mandela in their writ uh, that they served upon the South African government. Uh, 
In the end, the pharmaceutical companies withdrew that litigation. They uh, did not go on, go on with it. And the reason was because of all the adverse publicity that NGOs, both in the United States and in South Africa, drew attention to this fundamental injustice that had occurred. That Despite all of the good work that is being done in this area by civil society groups, um, by countries um, like Brazil and India that uh, continue um, to criticise some of the developments of in, in the intellectual property field, the reality is that patents are part of the global structure of the trade regime. They have globalised. If you join the World Trade Organisation, you have to respect patents over products. And that means that you, we, all of us, have to live with uh, pharmaceutical patents in areas that we never, uh, where they never existed before, in countries where they never existed before. Comment on the wider implications of all this. I think one of the big unanswered questions is how will this affect the structure of the generic industry? So we see in Australia, for example, that generic industries have essentially disappeared or generic companies have disappeared or they've formed alliances with big pharma. And that's a phenomenon that's taking place right around the world. So if you can't beat them, you join them. There are some pretty big structural adjustments taking place in pharmaceutical markets. I personally worry about the future of the generic industry. I worry about competitiveness in pharmaceutical markets. Um, so what we want are more generic companies competing in the market, particularly once a drug comes off patent. If generic companies are not around, um, if once patented medicines, uh, once the patent expires on the medicine, then in a sense, the monopoly continues. So it's very important to have a healthy generic industry uh, and uh, unfortunately, uh, patents really compromise the health of the generic industry. Viewers may recall Faisal Ismail, South Africa's former ambassador to the World Trade Organization. Talk to us about big structural adjustments in world production under the dominant approach to trade, the global value chain approach, and of initiatives to further strengthen that approach, initiatives that he opposed as trade minister at the WTO. Tell us how intellectual property rights fit into that global value chain approach. If we think of a value chain as um, a chain uh, in which an intellectual property right perhaps uh, originates in the United States and the EU, and we think of a global supply chain, um, such as, for example, an Apple iPod or something, who actually benefits uh, from... Uh, the assembly and sale of that iPod? Well, the answer is, ultimately, it's the owner of the intellectual property rights, the patent, the trademark, and so on. Um, the people assembling uh, the, uh, the iPod or the, the smartphone in China gain very little benefit um, from the actual uh, sale of that, the transport of that uh, particular uh, phone from the United, sorry, from China to the United States. Another example uh, are seeds. Um, uh, if you have patented seeds, the lion's share of the profit goes ultimately to the owner of the patent in the seeds. Now, how much do farmers get for their products that they grow under patent? Many farmers in many countries are now saying that they receive a very poor return for what they grow. But that hasn't stopped the companies that own patents in seeds, uh, in biology, from making extremely healthy profits. So again, we have an example of where the patent owners, the intellectual owners, are benefiting from these rules, whereas farmers, uh, labourers, the people that work in factories assembling these intellectual property-owned products gain very little from the process.
Summing up on development and competition, what's a key takeaway? One of the real dangers of globalising intellectual property rights is that it rewards the incumbents. So the multinationals that have a particular advantage now, whether it's in pharmaceuticals or whether it's in computer software, they get the extended benefits of monopoly privilege. And this makes it much harder for other countries, for firms from other countries to enter the market. So paradoxically, intellectual property rights, the globalisation of these rights, is all about underdevelopment. It's about entrenching the advantage of existing firms and making competitive markets more difficult to realise. So it's not really about trade or competition at all. It's all about the globalisation of monopoly privilege. The real danger for developing countries is that multinationals will simply suck up cheap labour in those countries and developing countries will never ever get to move up the value chain because the value chain will be owned, the technologies will be owned by a few key multinational players. So in other words, developing countries will be at the bottom of the value chain for a very long time and the existing players will stay at the top of the value chain for a very long time. And that's not what free markets and competition are meant to achieve. They're meant to achieve incentives to compete. They're meant to erode monopoly rents. They're not meant to establish monopoly rents. We're going to break and be back with part five. Please join us as we continue this series on IP Link to Trade with Peter Drahos. Peter Drahos, thank you. Thank you. And thank you for joining us on The Real News Network.